Happy Mother's Day and good Sunday morning, Sobel family and friends. My name is Chris Higginson. I'm the pastor of Blue Water Church in Kincardine, and it is a real privilege to be able to spend some time with you this morning in God's Word. We've been in this mini-series where we've been going to the scriptures, uh, seeking to develop a theology of hospitality. And this morning, I need to begin by begging your forgiveness, uh, because what I said was going to be a four-week series called First Impressions is now going to be a five-week series. Or maybe to save face, I could say that today will be like part 4A and next Sunday will be part 4B. So a four-part series just spread over five weeks, but you're probably not buying that. Uh, here's why. Doing church exclusively online is new to all of us including being new to you who are participating at home. And as new ventures often do, it creates uh, steep learning curves. And so your staff has been doing lots of evaluation on a weekly basis and consulting uh, other, other people, other pastors, uh, both from within our Be In Christ Church family and beyond, uh, consulting people who have more experience and more expertise in terms of preparing online services. And as we've been listening to feedback and listening to, to others going through similar situations, we really do want to take in the feedback and do our very, very best to make the online Sunday service as helpful and as encouraging as it possibly can be. So when it comes to the sermon part of the, of the morning, uh, We'll, we'll try and put this in baseball lingo. What we want to try and learn to do is to hit singles. Instead of uh, trying on a weekly basis to load, to load the bases and then swing for the fences, uh, trying to hit a grand slam every week, if that analogy makes any sense. I guess what we're saying is there's always going to be a sermon from God's word. You're not getting off that easily. Um, but hopefully... We can make it more um, intentionally focused, um, more, um, more helpful, more uh, precise, more concise, a sharper focus, uh, really with this overarching idea of making the Sunday morning online service as effective as it possibly can be. And so in all of this, um, we really do invite your prayers as we continue to learn new skills on the fly. And I personally want to thank you for your patience and your understanding when we don't get it just right. We haven't always got it just right, and in the future we won't always get it just right, but we're so appreciative of your patience and your understanding and your encouragement and your prayer support. Thank you so much. I do want to take just a moment and, and the Sobel Church, I want to commend your staff. Kathy and Jenna, Joanna, Andy, and Ken are working hard behind the scenes. They're doing really important ministry. And I'm so thankful for each of them. And I suppose because I collaborate more closely with Andy and Ken, um, I just want to express a couple of words of appreciation for these guys. You won't necessarily know this, but... Uh, Ken is currently tackling a really crucial project of ensuring that when in-person ministry resumes, that Sobel Christian Fellowship is staffed and ready and raring to go. And he's actually going to be sharing some important info about that in next Sunday morning's service. Ken is very passionate about seeing everybody at Sobel Christian Fellowship in a group and on a team. And I want to wholeheartedly commend that effort. And even over the last few weeks, as we've been talking about hospitality, we've been talking about um, uh, this thing of philozenia, uh, loving others. What an awesome way to get to know people that you don't know by getting involved in a serving team. And what a great way to be able to serve others that you don't know on part of a serving team. And then... You know, what a great way to get to know people you don't know, to, to be part of a group. And then to, 
to harness the power of group and to mobilize that as a group to go out and practice hospitality to others. This really is, um, it's really the stuff of kingdom building. And I know this is Pastor Dave's heart as well. Everybody in a group and on a team. And so Pastor Dave and your staff want for each of you, they want this for each of you, not just from each of you, but want this for each of you as a crucial component of your discipleship journey of knowing God, becoming like Jesus, and changing our world. And I do want to give a shout out to Andy, too, who's um, doing an awful lot of additional stuff beyond just his uh, regular ministry roles. He's logging a lot of hours right now. It's a good thing you didn't build in like an overtime component to his contract. Uh, Right now, Andy is Sobble Online. He's the guy coordinating video clips and doing filming and doing tons of editing and arranging for musical worship, and I think doing a really great job in that. Um, I love the efforts to try and blend uh, components of the in-person 9 o'clock experience with components of the in-person 11 o'clock experience and trying to blend that. I want you to know that's an impossible job. It really is. I've tried to do it before. It is an impossible job because, you know, we've all got preferences, don't we? We all want a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that. But I think as far as that being humanly possible, I really think he's nailing it. And I'm so appreciative. And I'm appreciative to the musicians as well. And so Andy's taking all this. This is a steep learning curve. And, um, you know, additionally trying to learn to do youth ministry exclusively online at the same time. So let me just say this. Uh, Way to go, staff. In Sobel Christian Fellowship, you should be very proud of your staff. And uh, please pray for them and please encourage them. All right. Let's uh, get back to our series. This is First Impressions. And uh, we're developing a theology of hospitality. Last week, we looked at what is arguably the most popular passage of Scripture when it comes to developing a theology of hospitality, and that's Matthew chapter 25. And this morning, we're gonna look at what is likely the second most popular passage of scripture when it comes to developing a theology of hospitality, and that is the story of the Good Samaritan. And uh, you find that in Luke chapter 10. So if you've got a Bible handy, uh, please open it up and find Luke chapter 10. And as you're Uh, As you're getting to Luke chapter 10, when you get there, then just scroll down and find verse 25. While you're turning there, uh, let me just say that this story just hooks me in right from the beginning because it starts with a lawyer. I love lawyer stories. One of my favorite things to do on vacation is to get the latest John Grisham book and then just to lie back and get enveloped in a good lawyer story. I love the courtroom context, the clever arguments and the strategies and all that stuff. And so when, you know, when we come to this story in Luke chapter 10 and right off the bat, there's a lawyer about to engage Jesus in this battle of wits. Well, I'm totally in, I'm hooked right off the bat. Now this lawyer in Luke chapter 10 is not necessarily like a lawyer that you would find in a Grisham book. This lawyer in Luke 10 has a very particular area of expertise. Most lawyers in Grisham novels are um, criminal lawyers or corporate lawyers, and uh, there are other areas of expertise that lawyers specialize in, experts in tax law, experts in uh, real estate law, experts in, I don't know, environmental law, family law, that kind of thing. But to be a lawyer in first century Israel in that context meant that you were an expert in Old Testament law, in Old Testament law. And so this lawyer, this expert in Old Testament law, well, he comes up to Jesus and he asks a question. And he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And this is a really brilliant lawyer. And what he's trying to do is examine Jesus to to hopefully expose some holes in his testimony. But of course, Jesus is so incredibly brilliant. And so he responds to this question with a question of his own. And he says to the lawyer, well, you tell me. You're the expert. You're the lawyer. What does the law say? 
And so this lawyer is kind of a little bit off balance at this point and says, well, you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, perfect, that's 100%. Now go and do it. Uh, I, could, I could tell you the rest of this story, but maybe it'd be a better idea to let uh, Luke do it because uh, he does a much better job. So Luke chapter 10, let's, uh, let's begin at verse 25. One day, a religious expert stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? (laughs) What does the law say? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. (laughs) Right. All right. Do this and you will live. Wait! The man then asked, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. Ah! They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. (laughs) By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, Uh, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. La 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la, whoa! Another man who worked in the temple who was called a Levite walked over and looked at him lying there. Please help. Uh, huh? But he also passed by on the other side. Then a Samaritan came along. Uh. Samaritans were hated by Jews. They were seen as lesser people, and Jews would not interact with them. But when the Samaritan saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. One room, please. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Okay, three points that we want to notice this morning. Point number one, cutting through the spin, cutting through the spin. So here we want to notice why it is that Jesus tells this story. And so he tells this story because this lawyer wanted to, you see it in verse 29, wanted to justify himself. He wanted to justify his actions. And so he tries to justify himself by asking the question, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And what he really wants to do is just to discuss this at length, to have this ongoing long conversation. Let's sit down and have this long conversation about this. And and actually what rabbis would do in the first century is uh, they would debate this a lot. This actual question of who is my neighbor, this was a very hot topic uh, of debate in the first century among rabbis and religious leaders and so on. This idea of who am I responsible for? Am I just responsible for the people with whom I'm familiar and comfortable? Am I responsible for just uh, Israelite people? If I'm just responsible for Israelite people, am I just responsible for the Israelites that I know? Or am I responsible for Israelites that I don't know? Or am I responsible for non-Israelites? And if I'm responsible for non-Israelites, am I responsible for non-Israelites that I know? Or am I also responsible for non-Israelites that I don't know? This is a tough question. How do we define this? How are we supposed to obey a law if we can't even determine who it is that we're supposed to consider a neighbor? We've got to discuss this on and on and on. We've got to put together some discussion groups and some uh, committees. and, and And of course, the nice thing is, 
as you're discussing something on and on and on and on, you never actually have to get around to doing anything. And we have all these wonderful discussions, don't we? Let me be a real jerk and expose a dirty little church secret. If there's something in the Bible that you don't want to obey, just make it really complicated. Make it confusing. Bring lots of ambiguity to the conversation. Get into long discussions about it. Or better yet, have a Bible study about it. Because Bible studies rarely get around to doing anything. We so regularly settle for conversation and information at the expense of transformation. And there are legitimate questions, I get that. And there's a space for discussion, there's a space for healthy debate. Healthy debate can be helpful. It can be like an iron sharpens iron kind of thing that makes us all better, makes us better thinkers. And there are legitimate areas of ambiguity where it's really difficult to be definitive, and we probably shouldn't be, but we can have discussions. But we can't just settle for discussion. We need action. And we can't just settle for conversation and information. We need transformation. Information in and of itself is not transformative. Knowing God, becoming like Jesus, and changing our world is about transformation, not merely discussion and information and study. And so what Jesus does here, he just beautifully cuts through all the spin. He cuts through all the nonsense. He cuts through all the circular discussions. And we see Jesus doing this all the time as we follow him around through the Gospels. And so this whole discussion starts with this lawyer asking the question, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus ends up this discussion by asking the lawyer, who do you think was a good neighbor? And so what Jesus does is he, he turns this thing from a them conversation to a you conversation. So brilliant. And Jesus is like, well, don't ask about who is my neighbor, learn to ask the question, to whom am I to be a good neighbor? And the answer is, everybody that you come upon who's in need. That's what it means to be a good neighbor. Absolutely brilliant. And so what Jesus does here, um, there's, there's no never-ending circular conversation that avoids any action. There's no delving into the minutia of ambiguity. It's just as simple as this. Just be a good neighbor to everybody that you come across who's in need. And if you do that, you'll be loving your neighbor as you love yourself. So first of all, cutting through the spin. And secondly, getting to the point. Cutting through the spin and now getting to the point. Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of this story. And the bad guys are the priest and the Levite. And you say, yeah, that's, that's what it does. Um, but think about the fact that Jesus is telling this story to a Jewish audience. And to a Jewish audience, the priest and the Levite, they were always the heroes. Priests and Levites were like religious superheroes in the first century. They were the heroes of every Jewish story. You always respected them. You never disparaged them. Remember back in the days of of uh, the old cowboy movies where the good guys would wear white hats and the bad guys would wear black hats. Well, the priests and the Levites, they'd always wear the white hats. They were like the superheroes, like Marvel superheroes with tights and capes and all of that stuff. The Samaritans, on the other hand, they always wore the black hats. They were always the villains. They were always the bad guys. They were never the hero of any Jewish story. They were always the guys who were trying to steal the strong box off the stagecoach kind of thing. And the Samaritans were descendants of Jews who had intermarried with Gentiles. And so Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem would look at the Samaritans as half-breeds, as religious mongrels. In fact, the Jews despised the Samaritans even more than they despised the Gentiles, which was a lot. And so these Samaritans, they're always on the receiving end of all kinds of prejudice, and they're always on the receiving end of a lot of xenophobia. 
And so when Jesus tells this story, and he makes this, in his words, this despised Samaritan, makes him the hero, and then takes these religious superhero priest and Levite and makes them the bad guys, he's absolutely shocking his audience. This is an incredibly offensive story to this first century Jewish audience. But he's doing this because he's challenging their us-them mindset. He's challenging their xenophobia. He's challenging their suspicion, their fear, their hatred of the foreigner, of the stranger, of those who are unlike them. And in very shocking fashion, he confronts and he challenges their prejudice and their xenophobia. And he's doing that to make a point. And the point is this, that in the kingdom of Jesus, there is to be no xenophobic thinking whatsoever. There are to be no judgments about people as a category. There's to be no kind of hierarchy in the way that we think about ethnicities, where we rank some, some high and some low and some in and some out and some good and some bad and some lazy and some industrious and some smart and some dumb and some trustworthy and some suspicious. There's to be no judgmental evaluations going on whatsoever in the kingdom of Jesus. And so Jesus is really illustrating that in the kingdom, it's not to be that way. There's no, um, there's no Levite versus Samaritan. There's no priest versus Samaritan. There's no Jew versus Samaritan. In the kingdom of Jesus, it's just people. It's just people, just, just human beings. People who have received, without merit, the outlandish and extravagant hospitality of God, who are then called to express that same hospitality to all others at all times, in all situations, indiscriminately and without partiality. That's the kingdom of Jesus. And so it's absolutely essential that all judgments be collapsed. And this is part of what Paul talks about in Romans 12 too, this renewing our mind, this changing the way that we think. And so in the kingdom of Jesus, we absolutely need to root out and call out and throw out all xenophobic thinking. There is no place for it whatsoever in the kingdom of Jesus. And that is the point that Jesus is getting at here in this story. So first of all, cutting through the spin, secondly, getting to the point, and now thirdly, looking in the ditch, looking in the ditch. And so the Samaritan was the good neighbor because he was the one who was willing to make space. Whatever kind of business the Samaritan guy was on, he was willing to be interrupted to make space for the stranger who was in need. We're not really told why the priest and the Levite were on the road that day, but what we do know is they were very important people. They had a lot of very important things to do. They were busy. They were on task. They had important responsibilities. They had meetings. They needed to have important conversations, and so they just didn't have time to notice and care for this stranger in need, and so they went over to the other side of the road, almost as if pretending that they didn't actually see what they just saw. Why would they do that? I think if they were to really look at this guy in the ditch, like to really make eye contact, they might be moved to pity. If they really looked and saw how really bad off this guy in the ditch really is and the fact that he really does need help, if they really looked, that would make it harder for them to walk away. It might make them feel guilty and they don't want to feel guilty. But at the same time, they also don't want to stop and help the guy because they're on a schedule. They've got important things to do. So just don't look, avert your eyes, cross to the other side of the road, keep as much distance as possible, avoid all eye contact. Have you ever done anything like that? Ever, ever created kind of rationalizations in your mind when you come up? come across need that's evident. Like, oh, well, he's probably getting what he deserves. Or, uh, you know, you make your bed, you got to lie in it. Or, 
I could give him some money, but he's just going to spend it on alcohol and drugs. Or, um, you know, he probably just tripped. He, he fell down and he's just relaxing. When he feels better, he'll likely just get up. Or it's a trap of some sort. There's probably three of his buddies behind the grassy knoll. And if I go there, then I'll get to, and I'll be jumped and robbed. And so I'm just going to keep walking. You know, we can come up with all kinds of very creative rationalizations. And whatever rationalizations this priest and this Levite created, they, whatever it was, they didn't want to see the reality because seeing the truth might obligate them to act. But the Samaritan, he doesn't cross over to the other side of the street because he is willing to see. He is willing to look. He is willing to, to look into the ditch because he's willing to act. He's willing to be moved by the plight of this stranger in need. He's willing to let that stranger's plight get on the inside of him. He's willing to get inside that guy's life, inside that guy's head, and to, to imagine what would life look like through his eyes. And if I was in the ditch, what would I want and what would I need in that situation? And so he's, he's moved to stop, to look, to act, to share. This is the very stuff of mercy. You know, Jesus said to the lawyer, um, who, who in this story is the good neighbor? And the lawyer responded, well, it's the one who showed mercy. Mercy is, is made up of two components, uh, empathy and compassion. Empathy and compassion. Empathy, M, the prefix, means into. The rest of the word comes from pathos, meaning to suffer. And so empathy means to enter into the suffering of another, to get inside that suffering, to imagine what it would be like to be that person in need. And if I was that person, what would I need and what would I want in that situation? And then that empathy moves to compassion. And the prefix calm means alongside of. And then passion, again, comes from pathos, meaning to suffer. And so compassion is to, to come alongside that suffering and to suffer with that person and then to utilize your own resources to meet that need. And that's exactly what the Samaritan does. He enters into, in empathy, enters into that suffering and then in compassion comes alongside, utilizing his own resources. He, he takes his own oil, his own wine. He cleans the wound, he, wounds. He bandages them, presumably by tearing strips of his own clothing and and um, then he lifts this guy up onto his own donkey. How uh, easy would that have been? Not very, I'm assuming. And then he goes out and he finds somebody who's willing to take this guy in. And then he pays the bill in advance. It's a lot of money. It's like two full days uh, wages for, a, for the average laborer. And this is hospitality. This is philozenia. Romans 12, 13. Always be eager to practice hospitality. And so this story is about being willing to be inconvenienced. This is a story about being willing to have your business interrupted. This is a story about being willing to make space and to empathize with the other and then to compassionately come alongside and share your own resources to meet a need. That's what it means to be a good neighbor. And that's what we're all called to be towards anybody that we come upon who's in need. So just a quick review here. What does Jesus do? First of all, he cuts through the spin of never-ending circular discussions about hospitality. He says, don't ask the question, who of them is my neighbor? Learn to ask the question, to whom am I to be a good neighbor? And the answer is to everyone that you come across who's in need. And then secondly, Jesus gets to the point that there is to be no xenophobic thinking in the kingdom whatsoever. It all needs to be rooted out, called out, and thrown out. And then thirdly, he challenges us to walk along the ditch side of the road, to be willing to look into the life of the one in need, and then to come alongside and suffer with them and in compassion utilize our own resources to meet their need, thereby being a good neighbor. Well, this story is also a very brilliant 
illustration about, about the obstacles that we face to being a good neighbor. And it's those obstacles that we're going to look at next week in part 4B. See you next week.